Hi, everyone. Welcome to the TOPS, the Tobacco Online Policy Seminar. Thank you for joining us today. I am Natalia Machado, an incoming postdoc at the University of Oklahoma Health Sciences Center. TOPS is organized by Mike Pesco at University of Missouri, C. Sheng at The Ohio State University, Michael Darden at John Hopkins University, and Jamie Hartman Boyce at University of Massachusetts Amherst. The seminar will be one hour with questions from the moderator and discussant. The audience may pose questions and comments in the Q&A panel, and the moderator will draw from these questions and comments in conversation with the presenter. Please review the guidelines on tobaccopolis.org for acceptable questions. Please keep the questions professional and related to the research being discussed. Questions that meet the seminar series guidelines will be shared with the presenter afterwards, even if they are not read aloud. Your questions are very much appreciated. This presentation is being video recorded and will be made available along with the presentation slides on the TOPS website, tobaccopolicy.org. With that, I will turn the presentation over to today's moderator, Mike Pesco from the University of Missouri to introduce our speaker. Today, we conclude our summer 2024 season with a single paper presentation by Michael Darden entitled Optimal E-Cigarette Policy When Preferences and Internalities Are Correlated. This presentation was selected via a competitive review process by submission through the TOPS website. Dr. Michael Darden is an associate professor at the Cary Business School at Johns Hopkins University, the academic program director for the Master of Science in Health Care Management at the Cary Business School, a faculty research fellow at the National Bureau of Economic Research, and a co-editor of the Journal of Human Resources. He works in the fields of health economics and health econometrics. Dr. Darden, thank you for presenting for us today. Thanks so much, Mike. Just going to share my slides here. <clears throat> Let's see. Okay, great. Um, yeah, so thanks for inviting me. This is um, really fun to present in this in this great uh, series. Um, the title is Optimal E-Cigarette Policy When Preferences and Internalities Are, are Correlated. Um, this paper has uh, been published this year in the Journal of Risk and Uncertainty. Um, uh, and despite that, I mean, I think it's great to present it because it highlights an important uh, important fact, uh, relative risk perceptions and their the incorrect relative risk perceptions that I think, um, you know, justifies further research. Um, and, and before I get started, I just want to be very clear about what I mean by the title here. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm going to take an economic framework to the question of e-cigarette policy. And so when I say optimal, I, I mean uh, the kind of a optimal and a kind of a utilitarian uh, social welfare framework. Um, when I say preferences and internalities being correlated, what I'm talking about here are preferences and like substitution patterns between cigarettes and e-cigarettes. And when those are correlated with internalities, what I mean by internalities are just systematic mistakes that people are making when they think about the trade-offs between the two goods. And in particular, I'm gonna be talking about incorrect relative risk perceptions. So how should we think about policy when we have correlation between substitution patterns and information stakes? Um, so uh, full disclosure, I've never received any funding from the tobacco industry or any tobacco uh, industry supported organization and funding for this project came from the Cary Business School at Johns Hopkins. Okay, so we'll do a little bit of an intro introduction. Um, I have a theoretical model in the paper. I'm, I'm just gonna sketch that for this presentation. Um, uh, I'll talk about my survey data, and then I'll try to come back to the theory to think about optimal taxation uh, of e-cigarettes. So just to get started and, and level set, in the most recent um, uh, National Center for Health Statistics data brief on e-cigarettes, uh, you can see in 2021, um, about four and a half percent of Americans were, were using e-cigarettes. There's a little bit of variation by, by sex here, but the real variation that you can notice here is, is by age. So for those 18 to 24, 11% uh, in the um, uh, using, using e-cigarettes, um, and that falls dramatically to when you uh, look at people over the age of 45, uh, 2%. So this age variation is important when you think about optimal taxation, um, and, I'll, and I'll talk about that in a minute. Okay, so the paper is going to be about 
uh, how should we think about taxing e-cigarettes? And there is considerable variation across the states in uh, answering this question, uh, both in the size of the tax, but also in the style of the tax. So um, if you look at the, the green states, they're, they're uh, taxing um, the wholesale price. Um, and you can see some variation across states uh, within the green states. The blue states are a specific per milliliter of e-cigarette uh, liquid tax. Um, you can see some variation in those. And then uh, the, the yellow states are some kind of combination of those things. And then of course the, the gray states are uh, don't have a tax. Um, so considerable variation, it's not obvious that uh, we've answered this question. Um, and there's a policy dilemma that's really interesting for an economist to think about in the context of e-cigarettes, is that e-cigarettes uh, may both, uh, e-cigarette taxes may both discourage youth initiation, that's a good thing, uh, you know, to the extent that we can prevent uh, the initiation, we can prevent addiction to nicotine. In young people, this could have large uh, implications going forward. But at the same time, higher e-cigarette taxes may discourage adult substitution. Uh, and, you know, probably that's a bad thing if we think that smokers moving, cigarette smokers moving to e-cigarettes would, would be a healthier alternative. So um, one thing I want to make really clear today, I'm going to be talking about adults here. I think the, I think the argument for e-cigarette e taxes, uh, at least as they apply to young people, is pretty straightforward. And I think higher e-cigarette taxes, uh, you know, any kind of modeling that I could do for you here uh, in, in the talk today would suggest higher e-cigarette taxes for young people. So I'm going to be focusing on adults and specifically adult smokers, because this is really an area where you might argue for lower e-cigarette taxes. And so I'm going to think about, again, the correlation between preferences and internalities uh, amongst um, adult cigarette smokers. Um, and then at the end, I'll talk a little bit about adult former cigarette smokers. But um, just to be clear, for, for young people, I think there's a very strong argument for, for e-cigarette taxes. Okay, so a little bit of background. Um, as an economist, why do we want to tax something in the first place? Um, you know, good, uh, you know, solidly grounded rationales for, uh, for any kind of taxation would be, first and foremost, externalities. The existence of costs borne by those external to a market. Um, in the case of cigarettes, there's some obvious examples here of secondhand smoke but also um, higher healthcare expenditures that are not baked into insurance premiums uh, of the smokers themselves. Um, and so we've got externalities. It's a little less clear about the externality argument in the context of e-cigarettes, but what you see a lot of arguments about where e-cigarettes are internalities. Okay, internalities, costs imposed on oneself through systematic non-optimizing behavior. And, and the classic uh, example of this is time and consistency in which someone who is addicted to nicotine says, I really want to stop. I really want to quit. Maybe I'll quit tomorrow. Maybe, maybe I'll quit tomorrow. I'm not gonna quit today. Maybe I'll quit tomorrow. Tomorrow comes and they're unable to kind of follow through with that plan of action. So good, good, good I think evidence that there's some time and consistency problems here that might justify some taxation. I, I'm going to focus on imperfect information in this paper, and I want to be very specific about what I what I mean here. So, here's here's some data from Hints, um, the the large cross sectional survey of the United States, and the question um, is uh, posed to respondents was compared to smoking cigarettes, would you say that electronic cigarettes are much less harmful, less harmful, just as harmful, more harmful, much more harmful, or I, I don't know, um, or missing, I guess. And what you can see, um, the blue lines, if we focus on the blue lines here, um, those are from the 2020 HINTS survey. And what you can see is that, uh, you know, 12.7% 12 12 of respondents say that e-cigarettes are more harmful than cigarettes. And 15% say much more harmful 
than uh, traditional cigarettes. 34% say just as harmful as traditional cigarettes. And so um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to argue in this paper that this is a significant fraction of people that are probably getting this question wrong, at least on average. Um, furthermore, this is something that has been around you know, pre the E Valley scare. So it's not just the E Valley scare that caused this. Um, and if anything, between 19, uh, tw uh, 2014 and 2020, you can actually see the proportion of people who are saying uh, something incorrect, uh, certainly on the more harmful and much more harmful to be growing. So we I, I'm gonna look at this and say that we have a, we have a, a group of people um, who, uh, a significant fraction of people who are making incorrect inferences on the relative risks of electronic cigarettes relative to uh, traditional cigarettes. And, you know, I think there is some debate about this. There's some open, it's, it's a bit of an open question um, as to, you know, exactly what the medical science is. We don't have lifetimes worth of observational data to look at as we do with cigarettes on e-cigarettes. Um, but I'll point to one, one picture. This is from Alcott and Rafkin's uh, 2022 uh, AJ policy paper, where they surveyed health professionals, physicians, and other scientists on the relative harms uh, of vaping to smoking. Um, and the question here posed to respondents of their survey, again, experts in the science uh, and the medicine, was if the harms from cigarette smoking, you know, could be normalized to one, how harmful is vaping? And what you see is that just almost all of the distribution is to the left of one. So less harmful with a, you know, with a significant fraction of people who are, you know, um, um, experts who are claiming that e-cigarettes are, uh, if anything, like much, much less harmful. Um, of course, there are some experts that are, you know, responded greater than one, but the majority of the distribution here is to the left, and you've got a lot of uh, mass in this distribution, uh, you know, around 0.2, so like a fifth is bad. So, you know, um, if you combine this with evidence from the UK, where, you know, surveys of experts there say, you know, even like 5% as bad as, as traditional cigarettes, um, it's pretty clear that there is some disconnect between the medical science and what individuals in you know, survey responses are, are suggesting. So um, just to summarize in the, the introduction, what we have is a situation in which cigarette smoking, um, terrible for health, we all know that, has declined dramatically in the United States. And we have fairly robust um, restrictions and regulations on cigarettes from taxation to indoor smoking laws, T21 laws, um, flavor bans, uh, advertising bans. Um, so cigarette restrictions and regulations are fairly robust. E-cigarette use, which has relatively uncertain health effects, has increased dramatically among young people. Um, and it also offers a you know, potentially uh, less harmful alternative for current smokers. Um, traditional tobacco producers have obviously embraced e-cigarettes, um, you know, if you're familiar at all with uh, the kind of ad campaigns that you see out of Philip Morris, and then, um, or at least the branding of Philip Morris and, and Altria more generally. And then many smokers, according to National Representative uh, survey evidence, have incorrect information regarding the relative harms of cigarettes and e-cigarettes. So my hypothesis um, that I wanted to test in this paper was to think about the implications of the incorrect relative risk perceptions. Um, and particularly, my thinking here is that if you have a smoker who thinks that e-cigarettes are worse than their current behavior, then that person is going to be less likely to substitute to e-cigarettes when the relative prices change. Okay, so we think from an economics perspective, relative prices are what's inducing substitution. And if a person is incorrectly informed about the relative risks, then the people who are incorrectly informed are gonna be less likely to substitute to e-cigarettes. And I wanna think about what that implies for optimal taxation. 
So the goal in the paper is going to be first to identify the correlation between substitution patterns and biased, re biased relative risk perceptions. Then I want to incorporate that observed correlation into a model of optimal taxation. And I want to simulate the optimal tax under different substitution patterns. So those are the goals of the paper. And the findings, so I did a survey of smokers. It turns out actually getting all of these pieces of information together is difficult. So I did a survey of, of, of um, smokers and some former smokers. 56% um, of survey respondents held incorrect beliefs about the relative risks. Um, correctly informed smokers, so those who correctly identified the fact that e-cigarettes were less harmful than traditional cigarettes, uh, are 63.4% more likely to respond yes to a question about whether they'd be open, in, open to substituting to e-cigarettes. And the big implication here from a tax perspective is that one argument for low e-cigarette taxes is lots of evidence of substitution between e-cigarettes and cigarettes. But the implication of this correlation is that even when you find evidence of mean substitution that's significant, because of this correlation, you're seeing uh, an argument for larger e-cigarette taxes. Um, and I'll talk about that more clearly uh, when I get to the results. Um, it just in terms of the contribution of the paper, um, you know, so there, so uh, a lot of this is building off of Alcott and Rafkin's great paper in the AEJ policy, and I would recommend anybody who's interested in this stuff to, 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 to check that paper out. Um, big literature uh, by a lot, a lot of, a lot of papers by Mike Pesco uh, and, and, and others uh, on the, uh, trying to identify the substitution parameter between e-cigarettes and cigarettes. Um, the first bullet point lists a number of papers that find fairly robust evidence of substitution. There is, it's not, it's not completely a slam dunk in the literature. There's some evidence of complementarity, uh, but that I would argue is smaller. And then the tax implications of the paper, um, the, uh, the optimal uh, e-cigarette tax from Alcott and Rafkin is $3.73 per milliliter. Um, I'm going to find bigger effects, again, because I'm going to build in this correlation between preferences and internalities. Um, and importantly, even in, like in an extreme case, um, you know, which economists are good at thinking about, in an extreme case where e-cigarettes and cigarettes are perfect substitutes, um, ignoring this heterogeneity says we should be subsidizing e-cigarettes uh, to the tune of a dollar and 69 cents per milliliter. But with the heterogeneity, you're going to see that the uh, optimal cigarette tax, e-cigarette tax is um, still positive and considerably uh, considerably higher. Um, okay, so uh, moving on quickly then to the theory. When uh, building this theory, uh, a lot of it is working off of Alcott and Rafkin, and then Alcott and Rafkin were working off of kind of standard public finance theory uh, that allowed for behavioral uh, problems. Alcott himself was the one who developed a number of these, of these um, papers, or these theories kind of in, in the context of sugary sodas, but also uh, other kind of uh, risky behaviors. Um, but what we need here is a, is a model that allows for externalities and internalities. Again, we're gonna, we need a, a rationale for taxation. Uh, multiple product categories, because we've got e-cigarettes and cigarettes, and we also need dynamics because of addiction. So it's not, a, not an easy theory really to build, to build up. Um, and what this should produce is an optimal e-cigarette tax that's a function of things that um, you know, empirical scientists can, can try to estimate so that we can use. Um, and so the basic idea with the theory, these are you know, two ways of expressing the same optimization problem. So I'm going to focus on the bottom uh, equation. And this is just saying that the value of being in uh, state S, where S is kind of a summary of how much tobacco you've used in the past, the value is gonna be equal to the maximum of this equation. And this equation is saying the utility of the consumption of um, both everything else and tobacco products, Q, um, uh, no, yeah, excuse me. So uh, the, the utility of the tobacco products, Q, plus the kind of normalized uh, utility that somebody would get from consuming everything else in the world, plus the discounted present value of the value in the future 
uh, assuming the person survives to that, that future. So the survival probability here is a function of their tobacco use, which is of course important when you think about you know, selective exits and all, and all that stuff. Okay, so in this context, an internality is exactly what it should be from something like intermediate micro. Um, so if you're familiar with intermediate micro, you know, if you think about the consumption of QY and QX, uh, and there's an indifference curve that kind of uh, meets a point of tangency here at, at point A, at point A, you know, you've got a situation in which the relative prices are equal to the marginal rate of substitution. And at point B, that's not true. So point B is like on a, and like less, less optimal as a result of that. And so what you're looking for with an internality is a situation in which the prices are not equal to the marginal utilities. Um, and so that's how I'm quantifying an internality here. It's the cost from extra cigarette smoking or e-cigarette usage that's due to some kind of problem like incorrect information or, or time inconsistency. Um, and so, you know, again, we think about internalities and externalities. So the marginal distortion, the, the, the rationale for some tax, you know, corrective taxation is the sum of the internalities for good J and the externalities from good J. Um, and then from a, a you know, a, for a, a policy perspective, the social planner here is trying to maximize this welfare function as the sum of everybody's utility. And what you get is a um, fairly straightforward representation of the optimal tax of e-cigarettes on the left-hand side as a function of a bunch of stuff that we can estimate. Um, and so I'll walk a little bit through the dynamics here. So greater substitution between e-cigarettes and cigarettes suggests lower e-cigarette taxes. Again, because if we can get people to substitute, we don't want to inhibit their ability to use e-cigarettes. Um, I, I, speaking of smokers there. Um, greater internalities uh, caused by imperfect information would say lower e-cigarette taxes and then greater internalities from time inconsistency or, or uh, you know, greater externalities imply greater e-cigarette taxes. Um, so going forward, what I'm gonna do is, is, is try to um, get some parameters from survey data, but I think this is a good place to pause uh, for some questions. Okay, uh, thank you. Uh... Michael, uh, let's turn it over to our uh, uh, discussant um, today. Um, uh, our discussant today is Dr. Antoine Bedev, an economist at the Federal Reserve Board of Governors. Dr. Bedev is a structural microeconomist and has published in the field of social and financial networks. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Mike. Uh, thank you very much for the invite to discuss this um, very interesting paper. So I have, uh, I would like to offer one remark and uh, one question. Um, you will see right away from my remark that I really like the paper, but uh, you know, more substantively, uh, you see how um, this is a paper that makes a point that often is uh, over neglected in empirical research that information and beliefs matter for choices rather than what is the objective tools. So many, uh, in many situations, um, um, this uh, this wedge uh, is is uh, overlooked, but uh, objectively wrong beliefs drive suboptimal choices. And so here uh, on one side the, the issue is well uh, can taxes undo these uh, suboptimal choices? But uh, just to stress uh, the the issue, I will go on I will go on on saying that the following: those holding wrong beliefs about the effect of cigarettes uh, versus uh, e-cigarette smoking behave as if they face different dollar value prices. So imagine you have a consumer that really goes in the store but that cannot see the price. For some reason, uh, he or she uh, sees a different price. And uh, and, and this, uh, you know, at this uh, when we translate uh, uh, this friction uh, in this way, clearly presents, a, uh, presents an issue. Um, now, uh, I, the question that I have uh, is, uh, and uh, Mike, I think uh, he um, alluded to this in the beginning, but very briefly. So incorporating youth smoking aspect of optimal taxation uh, to me, uh, and I probably haven't uh, thought as carefully as, um, 
I showed uh, um, so incorporating youth smoking aspect. So in the youth smoking aspect, it's not only uh, the wedge between switching to a less uh, harmful uh, option, but also the public interest is into um, holding the uh, initiation as low as possible. But uh, it, is it obvious? Uh, is it obvious uh, how the optimal taxation will look like if you're able to differentiate? Uh, the taxation by the age, if you can impose one tax for young and another for adult smokers. Yeah, I mean, I made the, I, I spoke at the beginning. Thank you, um, Greta. That's, that's, yeah. And so that's, it's a really important point. I mean, I made, I was, I was, I was briefly trying to make the argument at the beginning that I think that um, the, the case for young, for young potential tobacco users is, is to have a, a, a considerably high uh, e cigarette tax. And, you know, in an ideal world, you might want a lower tax for uh, adult uh, individuals, many of whom are not initiating any tobacco use. But for tobacco, for so so for non non tobacco users who are older, we don't see a lot of initiation. So taxes are not going to be preventing any kind of initiation. Uh, period. But for you know adult smokers, we might want a lower tax uh, to you know help help with help them you know substitute away from traditional tr traditional cigarettes so i mean in an ideal world yeah i think you might want different prices in a in a world in which we have to have the same price i think what's overlooked in this discussion is that what really matters is the relative prices and and the relative prices you know if, if, if i was in charge of policy i would say sure let's have high e-cigarette taxes but really high cigarette taxes and as a result, you would have relative taxes that encourage substitution, but also prevent initiation. Thank you. No. Okay. Anything further, Dr. Bidem? At this point, this is the only question I want to ask. Okay. Um, so there's a few questions in the Q&A uh, panel, uh, Michael. Um, uh, so first question, is discouraging youth really an unambiguously good thing? What are the consequences? How may uh, uh, how many of these youth will turn to cigarettes instead? Is that better? Well, I mean, I think I'm looking at trends there and you see just a dramatic decline in youth initiation of cigarettes over time. So uh, I think it, it, it was 16% at the end of the aughts, and it's now around 9% of young people starting uh, cigarette smoking. So if we follow that trend out, I mean, I, I'm speaking more about the prevention of, of initiation for any tobacco usage. Um, and so, I mean, overwhelmingly now, kids who become addicted to nicotine are doing so on on e-cigarettes. Now, it's not obvious that if in, in the long run that the health implications are going to be uh, as terrible as, as cigarettes, which is kind of the point of this paper, but um, uh, my sense is that uh, the, the trends are moving away from cigarettes pretty, pretty, pretty hard. And again, I mean, I, you know, in, in that spirit of relative prices, right, if we have a, a relative price of cigarettes that's higher than e-cigarettes, you can both incur dis discourage initiation while also encouraging substitution. Okay, um, I'm gonna paraphrase another uh, a question here. Um, I think there's the, the question relates to um, if we can think about uh, e-cigarette indoor air laws uh, in a similar way as to how you're uh, discussing e-cigarette uh, uh, taxes, would there be any implications of your um your results in terms of how we could think about other policies like indoor air loss yeah i mean i think it depends entirely well i would say i'm not an expert on that i think that um it does depend significantly on how uh on the health effects of secondhand vapor vape you know e-cigarette e uh usage secondhand usage um i don't know the answer to that but my guess is that it's much smaller than secondhand smoke um, but that's a, I think that's what would determine, that's what's driving the results here is the health implications of e-cigarettes versus traditional cigarettes. And I think in a similar framework, you would want to think about the relative effects of secondhand smoke versus secondhand vapor. 
Okay. Um, another question. Do we know how adults are characterizing the harmfulness of e-cigarettes? Could it be that they are thinking that e-cigarettes are just as addictive to youth and more appealing to youth than cigarettes, so are more harmful? That's a good question. I will actually show you, that's a really good point. Um, and uh, I can show you some indirect evidence on this. So um, it is the case that you're going to see that um, people who I label as having correct beliefs in the sense that they are people who think that um, e-cigarettes are less harmful uh, are going to have very different absolute beliefs. So not just relative, but absolute longevity loss beliefs about um, about about e-cigarettes versus traditional cigarettes, and so I think I think it is picking up this idea uh, about health effects rather than kind of some dynamic effects for young people. Okay, uh, and somebody somebody's also I'm going to paraphrase uh, wondering um, if uh, testimonials from actual vapors, if that kind of data could be useful in your uh, study. Um, any thoughts on that? Yeah, I mean, absolutely. I think so. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, there's a, there's there's a fair bit of like lingering misinformation as a result of the Valley scare, and so I think, you know, one of the implications of this is that you could, as 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 uh, Anton suggested, you know, there is a dollar value of the correction of these of this misinformation, um, and so I I think you know what we need are innovative ways to correct the misinformation and you know qualitative experiential kind of stories might might be very helpful. Okay, how about you move on and we'll save uh, the other uh, questions um, for um, the end. Um, and uh, people feel free to um, add questions um, if you have any any remaining questions to the Q&A panel and we'll get to them. Thanks. All right, great, thanks. Okay, so, um, you know, we've got this tax framework um, and we have, we have a hypothesis. So it's time to think about data. And I'll say that there are data sets that offer both e-cigarette, cigarette, and relative risk perception uh, questions, um, but they, they, uh, they lack um, some of the detail in running your own survey. And so I think uh, in the spirit of, um, in economics, you know, uh, survey research has really, really taken off lately, um, thanks to Stephanie Sancheva and others. Um, you know, popularizing the idea that you can do randomized experiments within survey contexts uh, if you're willing to, you know, play some assumptions on stated preferences. And so um, uh, that's that's the path that I took here. Um, and specifically, what I did was I, I posted a survey on the survey research platform Prolific. Um, Prolific, for those who don't know, is a, is a platform where um, thousands and thousands of survey takers can uh, uh, can uh, log in. And they can observe a set of surveys, um, and some of them are general surveys. Some of them uh, are specific to certain subpopulations. And if the, if a respondent uh, meets the criteria for that subpopulation, then they can take that survey as well. These are paid surveys, um, and so I posted a, a survey on Prolific, uh, offering a, it's a six six minute survey for current or recent recent cigarette smokers and offering an hourly wage of uh, $15 an hour. Um, so the initial sampling was for uh, a, a, a sample of 1,000 current smokers. Um, I'll talk about the recent smokers. Uh, uh, sorry, I'll talk about the former smokers in a minute. Um, <clears throat> but the uh, criteria was for current or very recent cigarette smokers. Um, I uh, was going for 1,000 of them. And the survey respondents were asked about beliefs regarding the relative harms, uh, as well as um, some stated preference um, experimental results. So I'll, I'll talk about that now. Um, the main question that I was asking folks uh, was very was the, was a copy of that from Hints. Um, so we'll now ask you about your perceptions of the health effects of tobacco compared to cigarette smoking. Would you say that electronic cigarettes are much less harmful, all the way to much more harmful? And I'm going to label, um, and, and I do some robustness on this, but I'm going to label incorrect beliefs as equally harmful, more harmful, or much more harmful. And again, if you think back to Alcott and Rafkin's survey of, of medical professionals, um, you know, 90% of medical professionals were saying uh, that the answer is somewhere between much less harmful and less harmful. So I think this is a, this is a valid characterization of beliefs in, in this context. Um, 
I also asked about absolute, so to, to get to one of the questions in the Q&A, I asked about absolute harms. And this is a question that you'll, you'll often see. So compared to someone who never uses tobacco, how many years do you think lifelong tobacco use would take off someone's life? And so then I asked about lifelong cigarette smoking and lifelong electronic use, uh, electronic cigarette smoking. Uh, and, and respondents were able to kind of move these sliders um, to their preferred answer. So I'll show you some results on that. But um, here's some summary statistics. So overall, 56% of the sample, um, a sample of, uh, 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 I had a final sample of 943, uh, to be clear. Um, so 56% of those uh, held incorrect beliefs by my definition. 43% uh, held uh, correct beliefs. If you look at the summary statistics, so um, uh, there were no statistical difference in uh, daily smoking between these groups. Uh, there was no statistical difference between the proportion of current smokers. You know, again, the sampling frame here was not current or recent smokers. So almost everyone was a current smoker. No statistical difference between price paid per pack and, and that sort of thing. But there were big differences in uh, usage of e-cigarettes, um, which again, isn't surprising because the way I'm defining correct beliefs here is that you believe that e-cigarettes are less harmful. Uh, and so uh, ever tried uh, e-cigarettes, 91% for the correct belief, 86% for the incorrect belief folks. Uh, current e-cigarette use, so 59% for the correct beliefs, 46% for the incorrect beliefs. These are very statistically significant. Um, so we have a situation now where we've got a group of people who have correct beliefs, who are the same in their kind of smoking behavior, but they use e-cigarettes as well. Then when we look at the absolute uh, um, absolute health harms, these questions. So again, the question was how many uh, years of life uh, will someone lose as a result of lifelong cigarette smoking? These were roughly the same between the two groups, 12.1 and 11.8, not statistically different. But when you look at lifelong e-cigarette use, the incorrect belief folks had a statistically similar level, 11.8 uh, years, year, years of life lost uh, relative to the cigarettes, but they had much lower, but correctly informed uh, smokers had much lower uh, expected longevity loss from e-cigarettes, 6.1 years. So these are the, the correctly informed folks uh, are saying that on average, they think that e-cigarettes are about half as bad, um, at least on a, um, uh, at least a, in terms of longevity loss. And that's pretty consistent with the evidence from, from Alcott. Um, I think their, their average was lower than that, but you, you could find a lot of medical professionals that would agree with that. So that's um, uh, just really quickly, uh, the people who are incorrectly informed um, are more likely to be female, they're more likely to be African-American, they're more likely to be of uh, less than high school education. I'm not going to put a lot of interpretation in, in, those, in those statistics, um, but there, there are some differences demographically. Um, and then substitution. So I asked, um, I asked respondents, have you ever considered or are you considering quitting traditional cigarettes and exclusively using electronic cigarettes instead? Um, and here, what you see, uh, oh, so I, I categorize open to e-cigarette substitution. On average, about half of the sample was, was open to e-cigarette substitution. Only 37% of those with incorrect beliefs, but 68% with correct beliefs. So big difference here in the openness to substitution by these beliefs. So this is the first piece of evidence that suggests that substitutability and preferences are correlated with the internality, with the, with the incorrect beliefs. Um, and then the other big uh, kind of source of internalities in the tax literature are time and consistent preferences. And so I used the uh, money, money early or later, the kind of standard in that literature 
uh, elicitation question on on um, time preferences. And this is the estimate of the time inconsistent parameter beta. Um, 0.7 is kind of roughly what you you see in the literature uh, for uh, is evidence of time inconsistent preferences, but it doesn't systematically vary across the two types. Um, so I think that was just somewhat reassuring that you kind of match the literature in this sample. Um, but again, big differences in their openness to e-cigarette substitution. Okay, so then I did, um, uh, I tried to incorporate some experimental variation here. And so I said, suppose that the price that you have to pay for cigarettes increased by X, where I varied X between one and $4. How do you think your current consumption of cigarettes would change? And people could respond, they'd completely quit. They would fall by some amount. Uh, there'd be no change or it would increase. <clears throat> so I, I included increase just for completeness, but uh, you know, I don't think the demand curves slope upwards. Uh, okay, and then after that question, immediately after that question, I said, if you faced the increase in cigarette prices from the last question, how do you think your consumption of e-cigarettes would change? And respondents could say uh, a large increase all the way up to large de large, large decrease, so uh, the full range there. Um, and so then what I did was I tried to categorize the patterns that you would see from the two uh, from the from the two questions the the, the increase, the hypothetical increase in cigarette prices and the responding uh, belief about uh, their behavior with respect to e-cigarettes. And so I categorized these into to three groups. So D equals zero was no change or an increase in cigarette smoking and no change or a decrease in e-cigarette consumption. So, um, uh, so kind of a, uh, you know, a null result there. Uh, D equals one is uh, one of the following, a decrease in cigarette consumption or an increase in e-cigarette consumption, but not both. And then D equals two is um, what I'm calling pure substitution. So here we have a situation in which the relative prices of cigarettes increase. We see the person decrease their cigarette consumption and increase their e-cigarette consumption. Um, and then I just modeled in a multinomial logit framework the choice of D um, as a function of the prices that uh, we saw that were randomly introduced and the interaction between having correct beliefs in those prices, um, uh, controlling for a, a variety of the exits that you saw in the summary statistics. And here's the results, um, the marginal effects from the logit estimation. Um, and so the green line is what I want to focus on. Uh, there were no systematic changes, um, uh, at least statistically, uh, in, 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 in D equals zero or D equals one. Pure substitution uh, became much more popular uh, in these price experiments. Um, there's not an increase uh, on the intensive margin of how much the price changed, uh, but you see that these are all statistically different than zero and positive. Uh, which suggests that for the people with correct beliefs, there was more action, more sub, more evidence of direct substitution. Um, and so that's where I'm gonna be getting, getting the evidence to inform my, my calibration. Um, okay, so optimal taxes. Uh, yeah, I don't have a lot of time, so I'm just gonna say that um, after a few assumptions, this is the formula that allows me to simulate the optimal e-cigarette tax. Um, S here is going to be the share of the population of type theta. Theta is just telling me, are you an incorrectly informed person or an incorrectly informed person? Uh, eta is the price elasticity of demand for each good. Uh, Q is the consumption of each good. Um, and then we have um, uh, the marginal distortion of uh, good J, uh, which is, again, the internality and the externality. The substitution parameter here, um, just for your, just to, when you look at the graph, this will help with interpretation. Positive values of the substitution parameter imply complementarity. Negative values imply the substitution. Um, and then tau is the tax. So um, I want to talk about the parameters that are used to, to calibrate the model. Some of these are from Alcott and Rafkin, but some of them are, 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 are new. Um, so the fraction of relative health harms alpha, this is, um, so, so basically we have a lot of evidence on cigarettes, right? Uh, we don't have a lot of evidence in many cases on the, on the health effects of e-cigarettes. 
And so what we have to do is think about transformation of the cigarette evidence into e-cigarettes. Um, and so that's a number of these parameters. Alpha is the fraction of the relative health harms. 0.21 is the average from the Alcott and Rafkin paper from their survey. Uh, and then these parameters tell us how much uh, uh, e-cigarette nicotine was relative to cigarettes. Um, average uh, milliliters per day when vaping. These are transformations that are going to help me move cigarette evidence to e-cigarette evidence. Um, the healthcare internality. This is something that comes from a, a, an old paper from Gruber and Kosecki in 2001, uh, inflated to today's dollars. And I'll say that the referees were quite critical of how big this number is. Uh, the interpretation is that the internality from one pack of cigarettes is $52. Um, which is really large. It is it is large. So I show some some evidence of some robustness of much smaller values of that in the paper. Uh, present orientation is you know we got from the money earlier or later experiments, um, and then these are just averages from DeSica and from the the, the tax policy center. Um, and then the type specific stuff. So I need in, in the in the paper I, I need to now start differentiating between the parameters for. Um, correctly informed and incorrectly informed folks. Um, the share with, with correct information, S, is going to be 43% from my paper. Um, the scale, the elasticity of substitution was coming from the price experiments of 57% uh, more likely to substitute. Uh, that's coming from the multinomial logit. Uh, price elasticity of demand is going to be the same for the two groups. That's coming from Alcott and Rafkin. Um, the share of days vaping are coming from the survey evidence uh, for the two groups. We did see evidence that correctly informed smokers were more likely to be using e-cigarettes as well. And then um, the information internality proportion. So I need to explain this one a little bit. Um, there's, uh, we need to know how, how much of an internality is created from in, in, imperfect information. Um, and so I, I draw this from Parks, uh, who do a randomized experiment where they inform individuals who are smoking of their lung age. So not their age, but the age that their lungs resemble as a result of their smoking. This number is usually larger than their current age. Um, and then when they did that, they looked one year later to see how many people were still smoking, and they found that the information effect was 0.178. Uh, and so I use that to scale the healthcare internality and then convert it to e-cigarettes. So uh, that's a kind of a mouthful, but basically what I'm doing here is saying, I think that the people who have incorrect beliefs have higher internalities, how much? Um, and that's, that's how I'm, I'm doing that. Okay, and then I simulate the optimal e-cigarette tax um, under a variety of assumptions about sigma, about the... Uh, about the substitutability, but remember that I do allow the, the substitution parameter to vary by the types. So in the black line here, I substitute, I, I uh, calibrate the model, simulate the model of the optimal e-cigarette tax um, for different values of sigma, the substitution parameter, with uh, you know no core. So essentially treating everyone the same. So like there's no uh, correlation between substitution and internalities. And this is kind of, this is very similar to what you see in Alcott and Rafkin in the black line. So when uh, when e-cigarettes and cigarettes are substitute goods, you see in this region, the taxes are relatively small. If substitution is extreme, you might even have an argument for a subsidy for e-cigarettes. But um, uh, relatively uh, straightforward here. When e-cigarettes and cigarettes are complements, they go together, you start to see pretty high e-cigarette taxes, um, much higher than what we'd see in, in, a, in a given state, for example. Uh, the red line allows um, the quantity of e-cigarettes to vary by the two groups. But the blue line is really what I want to emphasize here. The blue line is where I allow the preferences to be correlated with the internalities. And here, what you see is, uh, and this is the essentially the main result of the paper, is a much flatter line with sigma. 
So what this is saying is that even if you find evidence that e-cigarettes and cigarettes are very substitutable, the optimal e-cigarette tax is still positive. And the reason for that is because high e so so substitution, the, the reason for that is the people substituting from cigarettes to e-cigarettes are the ones who are correctly informed and have lower internalities. The people who are not substituting, who are simply taking more money from with taxes, are the ones who have the big internalities who are incorrectly informed. And so that's why you see this flatter relationship. Um, one thing I, you know, so um, the referees didn't like how big that uh, internality was. Part of that was just because inflation has been considerable over the last um, few few years. And so we have a situation where these, these numbers have gotten pretty big. Um, so I, I, I do it, uh, do the simulations for smaller uh, healthcare internalities. Um, and you get you get uh, essentially the same results. So smaller magnitudes, but the same results. the The key is not the actual number, but the 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 fact that the slope of this this uh, this blue line is much flatter. Um, okay. And uh, so the main takeaway is just to conclude, you know, theory says that taxes should depend on the value of the externalities, internalities, and the elasticity of substitution. Um, Evidence suggests that the elasticity of substitution is small and internalities from e-cigarettes are, are small. Um, a strong correlation between those substituting and the value of internalities, that's from my paper. I found an optimal e-cigarette tax of about $5, which is con considerably greater than the state average. Uh, it's also larger than Alcott and Rafkin. Their number was $3.73. And finally, importantly, you know, evidence of substitution for, uh, is not a rationale for lower taxes if those substituting have incorrect beliefs. Uh, and so that's that's the main takeaway of the paper. Um, so that's it. I'll stop there and, and open it up for questions. So thanks. Okay. Thank you, Michael, for a very interesting uh, presentation. Uh, Dr. Bedev, would you like to uh, do your comments? Yes. Uh, thanks again. I guess I will start by just mentioning that uh, Yes, uh, uh, this is impressive because, um, uh, well, while it's easy to grasp that information and beliefs matter, uh, the, here we have example that we need only not only a special uh, um, instrumentarium, we need a, a relatively complex model to, to handle this additional uh, quirk of, of our, our world. But also, um, I find it impressive that the author had to go out and actually collect additional information deliberately. Uh, to pursue this, uh, so I think that this is, uh, you know, this is this is something I find personally impressive. So, as um, somebody who appreciates, as somebody who appreciates um, dynamic models, and at the same time, uh, uh, I would like also the audience to be convinced that this is uh, uh, there are certain limitations if we don't uh, if we don't um, pursue such a more a more uh, elaborate. Uh, uh, analysis we we are going to be confined in 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 our pursuit uh my uh my question is uh now we have a dynamic model where individuals internalize the effect of their choices on the future consumption specifically if there are a couple of channels so they uh, this is a little bit subtle but nevertheless worth uh, highlighting uh choices affect the probability of survival both through contemporaneous smoking but also through affecting the future survival state. So the model doesn't have learning, and I don't want to go in that direction, but I want to go in the opposite direction. Uh, running dynamic models obviously has its fixed cost, and some may find this higher than the benefits. Do you know, do you have appreciation of the biases that are going to emerge if you are to confine the predictions of the model to a static model, one period model. I think that the simplest way to think about this would be to say that delta equal to zero. How much are we going to lose from this, um, uh, you know, from, from, from your findings if we're confined? The static model? Yes. Yeah, it's an interesting question. So in the current formulation in a static model, <clears throat> There's no reason not to smoke. 
<laughs> um, right? Because because the health implications are not there. Uh, if in, in a one shot game, this is um, you know when you do these models out to age one hundred, you have a problem oftentimes because you have to assume that people die at some point. <laughs> and so then the incentive to smoke when you're almost almost a hundred, for example, is is really high and the model says just yeah, you should you should really smoke. Um, so I, I think um, I think this is where the you know the age component matters. Um, so for young people, for people under the age of 50, you know the smoking smoking may decrease lung capacity. But in terms of the large kind of implications of smoking, you don't see any differences in longevity curves before age 50. And so I think that, you know, this would be applicable to a group of people. And maybe, you know, maybe this is actually, this is the most policy relevant age. So if you think that the big effects of smoking happen after age 50, so if we can convince 40 year old smokers to switch to e-cigarettes you have a big kind of policy result as a, you know, from that and so i think in, in in that context you know you would want to build into the model some um uh lung you know so some some contemporaneous health effects that make it um unattractive to smoke um but I, but I think, but I think that, um, yeah, I think, I think, to your point, I mean, I, I think the big effects, policy-wise, the big, the big welfare gains are going to be coming from people in their forties who can be convinced to not, to, to switch. Yeah, let me follow up. This is something. Uh, uh, this is something I find very, uh, very interesting, and uh, I want to push a little bit more this direction. Uh, so, can you deliver? And this is. This this is a big ask. I, I admit it right in the beginning. Can you deliver uh, an estimate? Can you deliver maybe not you know not within this uh, maybe this maybe completely new research effort, an estimate of the uh, welfare cost, dollar estimate of the welfare cost of a smoking that may vary by. Um, you know, by, by by observables, and certainly it's going to be age dependent as an estimate. Such individuals who prefer to resort to a static static framework uh, can control for the for this uh, you know future disutility, and that's in a way that they can do whatever you're doing, just thinking in a static framework. Okay, the disutility from smoking by age is it looks like that. We're just going to incorporate in a regression framework. You know, um, Michael Dunant has estimated it into a you know, much fancier model. We don't need to. And just use this estimate. Uh, of course, it's going to be heterogeneous, uh, you know, by observables. Yeah, that's interesting. I mean, I, 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 I have one minute to answer, and I think I need more time. <laughs> <laughs> I, think, I think it's an interesting point, though. I, I agree. You could try to infer. I, you know, one thing that I would like to do, I think that, would be a nice extension of this is just to simply think about the value of an information campaign that leveled these in that, that corrected the corrected the information problem uh and that would be something that would be straightforward but what you're asking i think is a little more challenging so i'd, I'd like to think about it uh thank you uh, dr budeb um we'll try to do one more question that i think captures two of the three q and a's um uh, it's about uh, black markets, um, and um, suppose if there's e-cigarette taxes, black markets could be created. Uh, is that factored into your model at all? Uh, it's only implicit in the in the parameters. So these are observed changes. This it's it's like how effective is a cigarette tax at actually changing behavior, and so that would affect the elast the observed elasticities that go into the model. It's not explicitly modeled as a black black market, but you could imagine if we raise taxes and cigarette consumption does not change, a reason for that could be black markets. Okay, thank you. I'm going to turn it back over to our MC to take us off the door. So we are out of time. However, if we still have burning questions or thoughts for Dr. Darding, you can join us for Top of the Tops.
a interactive group discussion after right after select top events this season. To join, please copy the Zoom meeting room URL posted in the chat and switch rooms with us when this event's closure. We will leave this webinar room open for an extra minute after the end to give everyone a chance to copy the link, which is bit.li slash tops meeting, all lowercase. Thank you so much to our presenter, moderator, and discussant. And finally, thank you to the audience of 175 people for your participation. Have a tops notch weekend.